Good morning, this is Bob Schmidt, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about architectural skeleton clocks. Now, these are skeleton clocks whose frames are made in the shape of monuments, or cathedrals, or palaces. And generally, skeleton clocks have been made for a long time, nearly 300 years. The form began in France in the mid-1700s, and by 1815, um, makers in England were producing skeleton clocks. And by 1830, the Condliffe family in Liverpool were making extremely high quality skeleton clocks, still highly valued today. Firms, commercial firms grew after the Industrial Revolution, and then after the turn of the century to 1900, the quality diminished to the point that by 1910, a small clock shop in England could buy a kit for 49 pounds, consisting of uh, two cast frames that needed finishing, uh, a fretted dial, and uh, four little turn finials and a base and everything. All he had to do was assemble it, uh, take a uh, abandoned pub clock movement, and disassemble it, put the fusee and the wheels and the skeleton clock frame. Uh, at a dome, and he had a clock that he could sell at a profit and for substantially less than a period skeleton that would have been made in the 1860s or 70s. Now, it is just these Victorian skeletons made by John Smith and Sons of Clerkenwell, made by William Frederick Evans of Hansworth near Birmingham, or made by William Haycock of Ashburn in Derbyshire. It's just these Victorian skeletons that I want to discuss today. Now the first city that we're going to start with is York in Northern England. Now it's very appropriate that we should start with York because not only is it the namesake for New York City and New York State, but for over 1500 years it's been a population and cultural center in England, very influential, and York Minster is the largest cathedral in Northern Europe. The first recorded church built on this site was in the year 627, and the current structure was begun in the year 1220. The cathedral was looted and fell into disrepair during the English Reformation and Civil Wars. Restorations in 1730 and again in 1820 helped to, perceive, uh, to preserve the cathedral in the form that we see today. Now, here's a shot at nighttime, uh, which I've added because it accentuates the spires on the top of the front two towers. And it's those spires which were used by Evans as the sort of apex or the, the scheme of things as he produced his skeleton clock frames. And here you see a uh, two-train skeleton, again, uh, W.F. Evans, uh, Hansworth. Uh, striking on a bell. This one has a little bit different dial with extra wide shields carrying the Roman numerals and it's not as finely pierced as some of the dials. Uh, this is a three train by Evans. It has the more normal dial, you might say it probably occurs in maybe 60 to 70 percent of the Evans uh, skeleton production. And on the three trains, regardless of the frame configuration, he placed the bells from left to right and he did it uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, rather than starting with just the big one and going with a small one. He alternated, you know, with the largest one on the right and then the next largest on the left so that they are visually appealing. Uh, they're further interesting because when they play, of course, there's a horizontal pin drum and the hammers hit on the bells uh, straight in front of your eyes and so it's, it's very appealing. Here is uh, another two train. This was a little bit different dial. And, and here we have um, another two train. Now this has gilt plates. Um, maybe, I don't know, 10% of uh, English skeleton clocks uh, were fire gilded. And uh, as long as they weren't polished over the years, it's still in really nice condition, such as this one. Now this clock has an unusual dial for Evans. It's a thin fretted dial. And I've had three or four Evans clocks with this dial. And it's absolutely right. Okay, and here we have uh, another Evans. This is like the dial on the first clock, but this one with a presentation plaque. Now, 
um, in the mid-1800s, 1850 to 1875, if you were a, a plant manager of some kind or a public servant uh, and you retired, maybe a superintendent of schools, it was very common for the, uh, your co-workers to take up a collection and to buy you a nice gift on retirement. And more often than not, I find that these nice Evan skeletons are presentation pieces made on retirement. And what a lovely gift to get. And here we have another three train, this one with a very uh, lengthy and comprehensive uh, uh, plaque at the bottom regarding its presentation. I realize some people take these presentation plaques off and throw them away. How sad, because they're such an integral part of the history, not only of skeleton clock making, but of the actual clock itself. Okay, here is a, uh, another two train. Now this two train, if you look carefully, I'm going to show you a close-up photo, but these corner pieces or buttresses are actually attached to the mainframe at a 45 degree angle, which gives it a, a sort of a third dimension and makes it very attractive. And here's the close-up. Maybe you can see that a little better. I was hoping this would come out a little bit bigger. But anyway, it was just one of the variations that Evans offered, always changing either a dial or some small little thing on the frame to make them more appealing to the public. Okay, now this particular York Minster is by John Smith and Sons of Clerkenwell. And uh, this clock is much smaller, probably five or six inches shorter than the Evans clock. And you'll notice that the, most of the shortness occurs in the lower portion because the spring barrels are just slightly above the bottom of the frame, whereas in the Evans frame, uh, the spring barrels are four or five inches from the bottom structure. So that's the easy way to tell a, a smith. Overall, this clock is about well, it's a little less than two-thirds the size of the Evans skeleton clock. You can see how big the dial is in comparison to the overall frames. And John Smith, they uh, did a very lovely job, as they did on all their skeleton clocks, of fretting the dial and making it delicate and very nice looking. Here's another uh, Smith York Minster. Again, this one's dirty, so it doesn't show up too well in the photo, but the key to look for, again, is the low pay, lowly placed spring barrels. Okay, this brings us to uh, Westminster Abbey, and uh, this is, you know, obviously in London, and I'll show you a couple of views. Benedictine monks established this as a place of worship around 950 A.D., and the Abbey has been the coronation church for English monarchs since 1066. The current church was started by Henry III in 1245, and it is perhaps the most important Gothic building in England. Certainly clock folks enjoy the fact that Thomas Tompion was buried here in 1715, followed by George Graham in 1751. These two men helped to improve the accuracy of timekeeping and laid the groundwork that led England to reign supreme in the clockmaking industry for nearly two centuries. Although there are exceptions, virtually all of the Westminster Abbey framed clocks were produced by W.F. Evans in Handsworth. Now, this is another view uh, in the early morning sun. Uh, there was an afternoon shot, but you can see the facade here. and. Notice all the Gothic uh, grill work and the vertical lines, arches and everything that you see on the stone itself. On the clock, which we come here, they actually fretted out the brass frames. The frames were cast and then, of course, finished with a jeweler's saw and a file and polished. A lot of handwork in making these frames. And it was definitely to depict as closely as they could uh, the monument that they were copied after. Here's another one. Uh, this is a three train. You'll notice again the bells, like in the York Minster, are spaced from right to left with the largest on the very right and the next largest on the left. The Westminster Abbey, most of the time, probably 95% of the time, has a solid dial rather than a fretted dial. It has four plates. It has two plates for the clock itself 
it has a third plate which carries the dial, and then it has a fourth plate which is spaced out from the third about a half an inch, which is a little archway or nave. And here is another example of a York Minster, and this one has a fretted dial. Now this dial most commonly occurs on a Sir Walter Scott Memorial clock, but it just shows that uh, if, if you had the money to pay, Evans was interested in accommodating you and building you the clock that you wanted. If you like the fretted dial better, that's fine. That's what he'd put on. Now, Evans also put on, as I'll show you later, um, plain porcelain dials for people that complained that it was too hard to tell the time against all the busy work on the clock. Okay, here's a, another example, a two train and with a solid dial and next is a similar clock in a, a, a gilt brass frame or box that's it's glazed with glass and the door opens in the front and the rear for winding and adjusting. And then here uh, is a very unusual Westminster Abbey. This is a single train, bell at the hour. You wouldn't think that they would make, go to all the trouble to make uh, this fancy cathedral frame with, with uh, extra plates and have just a single fusee. But somebody obviously wanted it. They didn't want all the fault or all associated with a, a striking or a chiming clock. So Evans accommodated and made this time you stay. It is, I, I notice it's, it's missing the minute hand. It has a gilt hour hand. And next we come to uh, the Brighton Pavilion. Now, no trip to England would be complete without uh, either taking the train or a bus south to Brighton. And to see with one's own eyes one of the most famous and opulent royal extravaganzas in existence. Now, in the clocks themselves, only this large onion shape is used as a theme, as we'll get to. But it's a very wonderful property, and if you, if you go, tr try to go in May or early June, because there are wonderful gardens, and there are uh, artworks here in the pavilion, and they offer daily tours, and it's well worth a visit. Uh, we've got another shot with a little different view, and onto the clock. This again, John Smith and Sons Clerkenwell, very typical of what you, what you see. Um, they don't show real well, but there's a line either side of the dial, a large, probably eight and a half inch fancy fretted dial, and there's a spread wing eagle at the top. And here's another with a red velour base. Again, everything typical. The lions show a little bit better in this particular view. Notice also there's a little fretted trim that goes up here on the top to finish things off underneath the eagle. That's sometimes missing, so this, this clock is all complete. And here's another one. Now this one, the fretted trim is there. It's just turned sideways um, rather than front to back. This is an interesting application. The lions show very clearly. And uh, you can see the, the fancy extensions on the, the setup clicks for the spring barrels. You can see the fancy trim that's put over the, the setup arbors for the spring barrels nice collets that were made uh, to assist in holding the uh, plates to the pillars. And here's a view from the rear. Uh, you see a good shot of the lions, how they're mounted. Of course, the gong in the rear, the big gong standard, which is typical of uh, uh, Smith and Sons. Smith and Sons, Sons tended to use this big club-shaped standard, whereas uh, Evans used uh, usually a block or a round standard, very plain. Okay, now that brings us to uh, Litchfield Cathedral. Now, the city of Litchfield is just 17 miles north of Birmingham, and the site has been a place of worship and religious study since the year 669. The Gothic Cathedral was begun in 1195 and is recalled visually uh, by its three tall and prominent spires. This church was severely damaged during the Reformation and Civil War, and its uh, current splendor was restored by the architect Sir George Scott in the third quarter of the 1800s. 
Uh, here we follow up with a little view uh, from the other side, uh, you know, behind the cathedral, showing the larger steeple. And here, from about uh, 1878, is a page from the John Smith and Sons catalog. Notice it's a line drawing. They didn't do photography at the time, but it's a line drawing depicting their version of the Litchfield Cathedral skeleton clock. And here is one of the clocks themselves. Now it's missing its little trim at the top of the spires and doesn't have that fancy of a dial, but basically a pretty good clock. This one has a full repeat for the strike, and it's a little bit unusual in that the, the, the gong for striking is actually in the base. Here we see a little bit different one. This one has a fancier fretted dial, and it has a fancy uh, cut-out brass trim on the top of the spires. And here's another one on a carved wooden base and similar dial to the one I showed you first. This one has a bell for the half hour strike and then the gong for the hour. And here's still another one with the little trims in the top of the spires and still a different fretted dial. And finally still another configuration also with its top trim and uh, little different steps and everything, but still very much a Litchfield Cathedral clock. Now uh, this brings us to St. James Palace. Um, this is an interesting structure. Mo most of you who have walked through London have g gone by this building. This was originally built for Henry VIII, and it still serves to this day as the business center for the royal family and all their assistants. It is one of London's oldest palaces, far older than Buckingham. It's situated on Marlborough Road in Pall Mall, just north of St. James Park. And if you do any walking around London, you are bound to go by this particular palace. And you'll notice there's always a guard out front, and many people stop to have their picture taken with the guard. Here's a uh, view of the clock. Um, this is a very well-made clock. Again, it's by Evans, and it has three plates. It has the two basic plates for the clock, and then it has a third, even larger plate, which is roughly an inch uh, taller and wider than the, than the clock plates. And the third plate carries the dial and has an archway uh, that creates, along with the skeleton frame, creates a nice nave where they have placed, it came standard from the factory, with a statue, a gilt statue of Queen Victoria. All right, and next is another example, again, just on a, a white marble base. <clears throat> again, you see Queen Victoria, and you see Evans' use, again, of the plain porcelain dial. Here's a rear shot, again, showing the gong. You see Evans' more uh, subtle, around uh, gong standard, and uh, Again, you have a half hour bell at the top and the hour gong in the back. Notice that you can see the three plates clearly in this view. Here's the rear plate, then just in between is the front plate, and then still all the way forward you see the dial plate, which carries the dial, and it, of course, is larger and more intricate, intricate than the other two plates. Okay, that brings us to the Sir Walter Scott Memorial. Now, uh, Sir Walter Scott, uh, lived from 1771 to 1832. And whether you visited Edinburgh, Scotland, or simply read about this famous poet and playwright, you've certainly seen the tall, four-buttress memorial built in his honor. Although he's world famous for his literary work, at home he was a judge and a legal administrator. Fancy that. In London, he was best known for unearthing the crown jewels that had been squirreled away up north after the coronation of Charles II in 1661. And they were found by Sir Walter Scott in Edinburgh Castle in the year 1818. And for this unselfish gesture and all the time he spent finding them, he was made a baronet by the monarch and was thereafter known as Sir Walter Scott. Now in the next photo, you can just make out, there's a little blue sky showing there, and in the center you can see the white statue of Sir Walter Scott, and even his dog is sitting there at the base of his chair. And on the next photo you see in all of Evans' 
creations. He has a gilt statue of Sir Walter and a gilt statue of his faithful dog. Uh, you can see these clocks have four uh, buttresses that come out at 45 degree angle. This particular version has a solid dial, usually they're a fretted dial. And here is a single train, again with the canted buttresses, and this with a, this is a large dial, probably seven and a half to eight inches, fretted dial. Now most of these timepieces are much smaller, probably you know, half to two thirds the size of, of this large clock. But someone wanted a, a large timepiece, so it was ordered, and so rather than make a striker, Evans' shop put together a large timepiece. And again, here is a time strike on a gong with the same dial as we showed you previously on the timepiece. And this brings us to St. Paul's Cathedral. Now, you look at this line drawing and you say to yourself, now that's not St. Paul's Cathedral. However, this was the first cathedral that was uh, built in 1087. Now there's actually been a church on this very site since the year 604, but that burned down after about a hundred years and, and, and this structure wasn't built until 1087. Uh, that burned in, 10, in 1666 and the site lay dormant with nothing going on until 1675 when the monarch uh, contacted Sir Christopher Wren and told him to d design a proper cathedral uh, that would be a special place for Londoners to worship. And of course, in the following photo here, we have St. Paul's Cathedral. And in the next photo, from across the Thames River looking back, you can see the prominent dome. And in the next photo, you see John Smith and Son's version of St. Paul's Cathedral. Now it's busy, there's a lot going on, but the thing that I want to emphasize is that that dial is 12 inches in diameter here. So it's very large. You can see the clock itself is very large. Now the dome portion of the frame here looks a little busy. It's hard to tell. Again, he spread the bells out from left to right. And um, they're hidden a little bit by the dome portion of the frame. Let's go to the next photo. Here you can see, you can see the dome portion of the frame a whole lot better in this photo. And, and you can also clearly see the bells there. Uh, this also clearly shows the, the fretting on the cocks and the fretting on the hour snail and things like that, the quarter snail fretting, and the levers and things used to release the chime uh, are all very finely made and highly polished. And here's a close-up showing uh, again, the fine detail, and the fretting on the dial, and the little crown. So notice that there's a crown, a royal crown, uh, at the outside of each numeral. And finally, this is a, I meant for this to be larger. I wanted you to see this close-up, but it didn't come out that big on the monitor. But again, you can see all the fine fretting on everything, from the cocks to the finely spoked wheels to the snail cut out. And this brings us, of course, to the last slide that we're going to show in this presentation. Now, this is uh, James Conliffe. This is probably about 1840. He began his work around 1830, and this could be as late as 1845, but this is the end of phase one. And his, uh, for the first decade, he put his balance right here at the top of the dial in a, in a prominent but yet not visually that appealing a place. And then, uh, as time went on, while well, he still maintained this motif of putting the spring barrels down on this base, and then four columns up, and then putting the front and back plates of the trains uh, between the four pillars, uh, he came up with this idea to uh, lengthen the uh, balance staff and to get the balance up to where it was all by itself, surrounded by its support, and it really was a uh, visually appealing change that he made. And that stayed with all of his work on for the next couple of, of decades, even after his son Thomas took over the work. Okay, now, I thank you for listening. You can get more details by looking on the internet. You can go to my website, Western Horology. I'll be gl glad to answer any questions. I'll be glad to send you images of any things that, that you've seen. Uh, I encourage you, if you have an interest in skeleton clocks, to purchase two books. One would be Royer Collard's 
a book titled simply Skeleton Clocks, and the second would be Derek Roberts' book titled English Skeleton Clocks. They both have a lot of detail. They tell about the history of the companies in much more detail than I've done in this brief presentation. I thank you very kindly for your attention. I look forward to hearing from you, and I wish you a good day. Thank you.